I turn with me to Genesis chapter 38. That's page 33. Page 33 in the Pew Bibles. We continue our series in Genesis. And uh, last time we were here, uh, two weeks ago, we met Joseph and uh, we started looking at the family records of Jacob. Uh, Joseph has ended up in Egypt. Genesis 38. At that time, Judah left his brothers and settled near an Adulamite named Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a Canaanite named Shua. He took her as a wife and slept with her. She conceived and gave birth to a son, and he named him Ur. She conceived again, gave birth to a son, and named him Onan. She gave birth to another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kezeb that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife. Perform your duty as her brother-in-law and produce an offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he released his semen on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the Lord's sight. So he put him to death also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up for he thought he might die too like his brother. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had finished mourning, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite went up to Timnah to the sheep shearers. Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's clothes, veiled her face, covered herself, and sat at the entrance to Anayim, which is on the way to Timnah. For she saw that, though Shelah had grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her and said, Come, let me sleep with you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me for sleeping with me? I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he replied. But she said, Only if you leave something with me until you send it. What should I give you, he asked. She answered, your signet ring, your cord, and the staff in your hand. So she gave them to her and slept with her, and she got pregnant by him. She got up and left, then removed her veil and put her widow's clothes back on. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite in order to get back the items he had left with the woman, he could not find her. He asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was beside the road at Anayim? There has been no cult prostitute here, they answered. So the Adulamite returned to Judah saying, I couldn't find her. And furthermore, the men of the place said, there has been no cult prostitute here. Judah replied, let her keep the items for herself. Otherwise, we'll become a laughing stock. After all, I did send this young goat, but you couldn't find her. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law has been acting like a prostitute and now she's pregnant. Bring her out, Judah said, let her be burnt to death. As she was being brought out, she sent her father-in-law this message. I'm pregnant by the man to whom these items belong. And she added, examine them. Whose signet ring, cord and staff are these? Judah recognised them and said, she is more in the right than I, since I did not give her to my son Sheila, and he did not know her intimately again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand and the midwife took it and tied a scarlet thread around it, announcing, this one came out first. But then he pulled his hand back in and his brother came out. Then she said, you've broken out first. So he was named Perez. Then his brother who had the scarlet thread tied to his hand came out and was named Zerah. This is the word of the Lord. Well, you've got an outline there. Uh, God willing, there won't be too many questions at the end, but we'll see how we go. And uh, we're going to spend a bit of time in this passage Uh, I think it would be fair to say that a passage like this provokes questions. I know in staff meetings we get to a passage like this and the first question is, who's got to preach on this one? Why is a passage like this in God's Word? And not only is why is a passage like this in God's Word, 
But why is it interrupting such a wonderful story like Joseph's? Couldn't we just stick with Joseph? Uh, What good is there in a passage like this? How do we understand such a passage and its culture when they seem so foreign to our world today? And, And then you might pause and ask some deeper questions. After all, this is God's mob. This is Abraham's family through whom God said, I'm going to save the world. How is that even possible when they are so dysfunctional? I mean, who's going to save this mob, let alone use them to save the world? Now, I actually think if you go a little bit deeper than that, you'll find that such questions aren't too distant from us. Have you looked around in the last fortnight and gone, what hope is there for the world? Who could possibly save it? Uh, Has there ever been a moment when you've gathered with God's people and something's happened and you've gone away and gone, God's going to use this mob to proclaim Jesus in Narrabri? How is that even possible? Well, I think the answer to those questions is in a passage like this. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It is a little confronting at times. And we've come to a passage uh, like the one we read a little earlier in Genesis 35 that is confronting. Uh, Father, please remind us that this is your word, that you are revealing your nature and character through it. Uh, Father, you're also revealing our nature and character as human beings who bear your image. And Father, you are pointing us to the one who will save us, Jesus Christ. Please remind us of these truths today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, point two on the outline, God has committed through a family connected with a bloke called Abraham. Uh, God has said that I'm going to save the world through this family. Now, before we go any further, I want you to at least grasp that thought in your mind. Uh, at, at some point this week or in the next fortnight, when you wonder what is going to save the world, just remember Abraham's family. Not environmental policy, not a drop in interest rates, Not a change in rising living costs, not world peace, but Abraham's family. God's going to save the world through this family. And and let me tell you, there is no functional family in God's word up until this point. They're all dysfunctional, aren't they? I, I find that a great encouragement, a really terrific encouragement that God has said, this is who I'm going to work with. God's promise to have a people of his own in his place, living with him under his law, given through his grace, his undeserved kindness, moves through the generations of Abraham. Saying, ah, that's not easy to see. Uh, but up the top you've got Abraham, then it moves to Isaac, then it moves to Jacob. Each time it moves, we're told that we're going to get the family records of the next generation. I mean, chapter 37, verse 2, these are the family records of Jacob. Uh, Just get this straight, we're not looking at the family records of Joseph, even though he dominates. We're looking at the family records of Jacob, and Jacob had other sons besides Joseph, didn't he? So it shouldn't surprise us that we get a glimpse of them. Okay, there they are in all of their glory with the four women that produced them and Jacob as the father. And the eldest son, Reuben, has disgraced the family. Genesis 35, verse 22, when he sleeps with his father's concubine, effectively saying, I wish dad were dead. I'm the one in charge, while dad is still alive. The next two boys, Simeon and Levi, have disgraced the family in Genesis 34, verse 30, when they went on a bloodthirsty rampage that slaughtered men, women, and children, and they disgraced the family. So that means that the now nominal head of the boys who become the 12 tribes of Israel is, well, it's not Reuben, it's not Simeon, it's not Levi, it's Judah. Uh, We met Judah a little earlier in Genesis 37, verses 26 to 28. Now, instead of killing Joseph like all the others wanted to do, Judah suggests selling Joseph. That's a wise economic decision. Get rid of the boy, no blood on your hands, make a profit. Now, the picture of Judah at that stage is ambivalent, although perhaps not encouraging. He certainly appears to be fairly self-centred and driven by base economics. Joseph goes to Egypt. Judah moves house. Look at verse 1. At that time, Judah left his brothers and settled near an Agilamite named Hira, 
There Judah saw the daughter of a Canaanite named Shua. He took her as a wife and slept with her. She conceived and gave birth to a son, and he named him Ur. She conceived again, gave birth to a son, and named him Onan. She gave birth to another son and named him Sheila. It was at Kezeb that she gave birth to him. Basically, we see Judah living here and then moving house. And as he moves house, he gets a wife and he gets three children. The picture of Judah, as you move through this, moves from ambivalent to rebellious. He left his family. And when he left his family, he made a marriage decision that was deliberately disobedient towards the clear expression of God's mob. In Genesis 24, 3, Abraham said very clearly, Isaac must not marry a Canaanite woman. In Genesis 28, verse 1, Isaac made clear that Jacob must not marry a Canaanite woman. In Genesis 38, verse 2, Judah goes and marries a Canaanite woman in direct disobedience. And the language isn't the language used of the lovely account of Isaac laying eyes on Rebekah or Jacob meeting Rachel, we're meant to get the idea that this is a marriage of lust. He came, he saw, he conquered. Three sons are born. Judah's parenting is not portrayed in the most positive of lights, is it? He manages to organise a Canaanite wife for his eldest son, Ur. That's Tamar, again disobeying the clear command of God's people. Ur is described as evil in the Lord's sight and the Lord put him to death. You mustn't miss the name used for God there. It's the covenantal name. It's the relational name. It's the personal name. Judah has rebelled against the Lord and so does his firstborn son and he's put to death. Now when Jacob loses Joseph, his 11th son, Jacob bursts into tears. What does Judah do? We're not told he wept at all. No sign of sorrow or mourning. The custom of the nations around Jacob's mob at this time is quite interesting. It's foreign to our sensibilities and I don't recommend it. But it does become one of the commands of God to his mob at this point in Deuteronomy 25. The widow marries the next son in the family. Tamar should marry Onan. And if there's no male heir produced, their firstborn son becomes the heir of the whole family. In this way, the family name and line is continued. Judah speaks to his second son, Onan, lays out his responsibilities. What does Onan do? He rebels completely against his father, but more deeply, if you think about it, against the clear promise of God. God had said that the family of Abraham would be fruitful and multiply. And Onan says, I want no part in that. The assessment's very clear there in verse 10. What he did was evil in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. The third son, Sheila, is too young. So on the surface, Judah does the wise thing, sends his daughter-in-law back to her father's house to wait for the day when Sheila's grown up. But deep down, we learn a little bit more about Judah's character. Look there in verse 11. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought he might die too, like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. Judah is a mercenary, money-hungry man. He'll sell his brother for coin. He's driven by lust. He's a hard man who shows no sorrow for the death of his firstborn son. Not only is his parenting deficient, he's now revealed as superstitious. Tamar has a black widow. Everyone who marries her dies so I better send her away what a bloke to have in your family tree what an upstanding member of the community here is the leader of the future 12 tribes of Israel who will save the world and what do we have Even more, there are some eternal truths established just in these 11 verses in a character study. And they're very simple truths. First, sin is serious. Sin is serious. The constant refrain here is of the serious nature of sin. Sin damages, 
Sin destroys, sin degrades, sin dehumanises, sin despises, sin is despicable. I don't know about you, but I often forget that. I often forget that truth and I minimise sin or I excuse it as a member of God's people. An exaggeration? It's a lie. Speeding? Disobedience. Pornography? That's adultery. Materialism? Serving another God. Anger? That's murder. Gossip? Is slander. And greed? is idolatry. Sin is serious, isn't it? Secondly, sin is judged. All sin has consequences. And often in God's word, as we hear in Romans 1, the judgment of sin is when God hands us over to its consequences. Judah has turned his back on the promise of the Lord. And he experiences the consequences which are judgment on him. Ur and Onan turn their back on the promises of the Lord and their sin is judged, just as God said he would in Genesis 2. And we've got to recognise which family this is. This isn't the world out there, is it? This is God's family, the family of Abraham. Sin is judged even within God's mob. Too often we forget that truth and we don't acknowledge that the sins we commit will have consequences and those consequences are God's judgment, even within the people of God. So at this point, we're confronted by a dysfunctional, damaging, disastrous family that's steeped in sin. And God's going to use them to save the world. The days move on. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse 12. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had finished mourning, he and his friend Hira the Agilomite went up to Timnah to the sheep shearers. Now, I'm quite slow when it comes to learning lessons from Genesis. Okay, One of the lessons I've had to learn time and time again is be aware of the time covered. Let me just walk you through what we've seen in the first 11 verses. Judah moved, Judah got married, Judah fathered three boys, Judah's eldest boy married, died, Judah's second boy married, died, Judah's wife died, and the youngest son of Judah has grown up. How many years do you think that covers? In the space of these verses, I think a conservative estimate is we've covered 20 years, probably up to 25 years. And so all this is going on whilst all that stuff with Joseph in Egypt is going on. And so when we get to Genesis 44, we're about at the same time. We're about at the same time. And who do we meet again in Genesis 44? Judah for the second time. And so when we meet him, knowing this time frame, we actually have our understanding of him set. And we've followed two boys growing up together, haven't we? Joseph and Judah. And we see the change in their natures, these two crucial sons of Jacob who will lead to the salvation of the world. So just keep that time frame in mind. We're covering 20 to 25 years here. And at this point, there's still not much to recommend Judah, is there? Uh, his wife has died. He's mourned her. Now he heads off to the sheep shearing at Timna. Now, for us, that seems pretty tame. I've worked in shearing sheds. Uh, it's not a party until you get to the cutout. But the whole festival of sheep shearing was a party. <laughs> there was massive amounts of drinking. There were massive numbers of cult prostitutes everywhere. You would celebrate the bounty of what you'd earned, and then you'd sleep with a prostitute in order to guarantee the fertility of the next few years. That's the context. So when we hear that Judah went up to the sheep shearing, we know what's going on inside. I've done the morning. Wife's dead. It's time to party. Tamar hears of Judah's arrival, and it's time to confront him. Look at verse 14. So she took off her widow's clothes, veiled her face, covered herself, sat at the entrance to Anaim, which is on the way to Timnah, for she saw that though Sheila had grown up, 
he's what, 17, 18, she had not been given to him as a wife. Judah has failed in his responsibilities. He's neglected what he should have done and promised to do. And Tamar takes matters into her own hands. She's been in mourning all these years. Do you notice that? She changes. She sits where Judah will notice her. There's not much to recommend Judah's character. Look at verse 15. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her and said, come, let me sleep with you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. What follows is quite revealing of Judah, emphasising his nature. Economic transaction for a night of lust. A goat and a guarantee of a passport, credit card and birth certificate. That's literally what he handed over. Passport, credit card, birth certificate for sex. Now, as readers, we know exactly what is happening. We know exactly what he's doing. But please, we've got to also notice the parallels. When Isaac was deceived by Jacob, there were identity markers and a goat. When Jacob was deceived about the death of Joseph, there was an identity marker and a goat. When Judah is deceived because of his ungodly nature, there is identity markers and a goat. Something is horribly familiar about this dysfunction, isn't it? This family just moves in these circles. And we already know the outcome. Verse 18, Tamar is pregnant. All the parties return home to their normal lives. Judah pays what he owes. He goes to pay the goat, doesn't he? No, he doesn't. Hey, Hira, do you you want to take this goat down? I just don't want people to know that I've paid the goat, you know. He's a wuss. He's a coward. He's gutless. And they discover the embarrassing truth. There has never been a cult prostitute in Timnah. We don't know if Judah suspected the truth, but we do know that he wanted to avoid embarrassment. That's what we do with sin, isn't it? Let's just keep it quiet. Let's just sweep it under the carpet. Let's hope no one notices. Three months later, a message arrives. Tamar is pregnant, caught in adultery. It is adulterous because she is technically betrothed to Sheila, even though Judah has failed her. Judah pronounces his judgment in all of his kindness. Bring her out, Judah said, let her be burnt to death. Again, his character. Now, we don't know if he understood what was going on, but he immediately jumped to the worst punishment possible for the worst possible sin. And if you know your Bibles as a good Jewish reader, and you know, you would, you would know that both parties get burnt. The exposure is subtle and brutal. Look at verse 25. As she was being brought out, she sent her father-in-law this message. I'm pregnant by the man to whom these items belong. She added, examine them. Whose signet ring, cord and staff are these? Can you imagine opening that parcel? And what's his response? Judah recognised them and said, she is more in the right than I since I did not give her to my son, Sheila. Judah's confronted with the truth. His character is exposed. His sin is made public. You couldn't hide such a package in a small town. And he immediately recognises the truth. Tamar is more in the right. Tamar is an outsider. She's a Canaanite. She is not of Abraham's family, but she has willingly bound herself to this mob. She has conducted herself honourably within what she could do. She has fulfilled her role. She has entrusted herself to the family of God's mob and they've been despicable. And she has been more in the right. Here's an eternal truth. Sin's always going to get exposed, isn't it? And righteousness will always be revealed. I don't understand the culture of these times. And let me tell you, it offends most of my sensibilities. But that truth is there. Sin will be exposed. Righteous living will be exposed. But this question still remains. How is God going to save the world through these people? That's still there, isn't it, that question? 
And so at point four, we turn to verse 27. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand. The midwife took it, tied a scarlet thread around it, announcing, this one came out first. But then he pulled his hand back and his brother came out. Then she said, you broke it out first. So he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread tied to his hand, came out and was named Sarah. You remember these kind of things, twins? A younger one and an older one, the colour red. Does that sound familiar? Okay. We've seen this line before. We've seen this kind of combat before. We've seen the younger put above the elder before. And in God's mercy, the family line of Judah is maintained, isn't it? In a remarkable, unforeseen way, and the younger leads the older. Now, next week, thankfully, you'll move back to Joseph. Okay, I was not game to do this in a first-person narrative, but maybe next week, who knows? But we've got these four observations. Sin matters, sin is judged, no sin remains hidden, and Judah is changing. But this question remains, how will this family save the world? How will this family save the world? Now, we do meet Judah again, and we do meet Judah later on uh, in Genesis 44, But I hope you listen carefully to the other readings that Dan brought us because they reveal some very important truths. At the end of Ruth, and let me tell you, this is the account of a woman from outside Abraham's family who attaches herself truthfully to Abraham's family and trusts herself to God. At the end of Ruth, we have a certain name again, don't we? What name? Well, there's the name of Perez, the younger one, who ended up coming out first. And and do you see where that name leads? Down to verse 22. Who does Perez lead to? Perez leads to King David, the greatest king of God's people, the one to whom God made a promise and said, David, through your family, there'll be a king forever. And then when we get to the start of the first book in the New Testament, Matthew's good news account of Jesus, You have the same family tree, and there you have it in verse 3. You have Tamar and Perez, and Judah doesn't avoid his responsibility either, does he? So there's the answer to our question. How will this family save? Well, this dysfunctional, sinful, disastrous family is exactly the family that God says, this is my boy's family tree. And when you go through that family tree, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, You meet continually dysfunctional people, don't you? You meet people who are beset by sin, people who are disastrous. You meet consistently God's grace confronting sin and producing the next generation, moving constantly to which man? Jesus Christ. Uh, You have Tamar. uh, You have Rahab. You have Ruth. You have Bathsheba, all outsiders who bind themselves to God's people, throw themselves upon God's mercy and realise that God's grace is enough even in the dysfunction that they have experienced personally. How will God save the world through this family? By their good deeds? No. By their morality? No. By his what? His grace. His grace, it says, I'm looking for the outsider. Now, please don't hear me wrongly. At no point does God condone or excuse the sin, does he? God's grace confronts sin. God's grace doesn't sweep sin under the carpet. It's there in all of its ugliness. And as we begin to see with Judah, God's grace confronts sin and starts to change sinners. Why is a passage like this in God's word? Remember those questions we began with them at point five on the outline? Uh, This passage is here, so we are confronted by the reality and the horror and the damage of sin inside God's mob. There are many passages like this in the Bible. None of them are superfluous because we keep forgetting how serious sin is, don't we? How damaging it is. Whether it's horrific sin like this or sins of omission, things we just don't do, or sins of commission, things we decide to do, sins of negligence or apathy, sin of aggression, sin is horrible. Sin is destructive. Sin is damaging. And we must lament and repent of sin. 
in a family tree like that, the only hope of any salvation is in the grace of God because none of the humans are going to contribute anything. The only thing going for this family is the grace of God. The grace of God that takes the younger, Perez, and continues the line of Judah right through to Jesus Christ. Only grace will deal with the dysfunction and damage of sin. Please recognise that truth, grace alone. And that grace is sufficient. That grace is sufficient to work through a family tree like that. I want you to notice that in this family tree there are no bars to jump, there are no standards to reach, there's no educational qualification, there's no social history, there's no skin colour bar. God's grace is for who? Any person. In fact, there is nothing a human can do that will stop the grace of God being available except rejecting that grace. That grace is sufficient to take a person like Judah and transform him. Take a woman like Tamar, who is more right than Judah, confront sin and bring the outsider in and change the person. Change them. That grace is sufficient to take a group like Jacob's family, one of them sold into slavery, one completely dysfunctional, take men like that and work salvation for the world. So look around. God's grace is sufficient to take a group like this and transform a town like Narrabri. As we share with people the amazing grace that we see in Genesis 38. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. It really is confronting, but thanks for its truth. The truth that points us to our dysfunction and sin and to your grace. Thank you for such a family tree. Thank you for the person that it ends in, in Jesus Christ alone. Father, give us great confidence that we can bring any sin to you and your grace will forgive it and that you can use us by your grace alone in this town. In Jesus' name, amen.